there are so many favorite memories of honing horses. It's really hard to pick a favorite. But I think, I think my favorite, which still happens from time to time, is when I, I had first moved out into the desert and bought my 10 acres and started to set up my ranch. And I had my uh, Ulrich's Olica, my, my Appaloosa Stallion that I bought with my best friend. And he was out there and the sun was shining on him. And I looked out my bedroom window and I just remember the rush of amazement that God had granted my childhood dream of owning horses and breeding horses. And not just granted it, but gifted me with this fabulous, fabulous animal. I, even today at 22, I was just looking at him the other day in the pasture and saying, God, I do not know why you trusted me with Olicut. He's just phenomenal. So I guess that's my favorite of, of, of billions and billions of wonderful memories. In 2004, um, I was running not only my breeding business, but also a boarding stable. And I started seeing different indicators that the economy was um, not as healthy as it seemed. I do remember I started to have a lot of people that, had, that truly loved their horses, truly cared about their horses, not being able to pay their board bill. I think that was when I had my first repossession on a horse. and. I said to my best friend, who's my partner, I said, I think we'd better not breed, we'd better just have the 2005 babies and, and not breed next year and, and keep watching the things that happen. And by the time the 2005 babies were born, um, things really looked ugly. Uh, they, they started to look very dark on the horizon, like, like a storm coming. And we decided not to breed. And we thought we'd just maybe be a year, or a year and a half, two years. It was a horrific decision, and I'm very, very grateful that we didn't breed. That was our last full crop was 2005. And we have never, it's just never come back since then. Uh, the latest study that was done, or survey that was done in 2009, uh, indicated that in 2007 there were 170,000 unwanted horses in the United States. That's a Based on the statistics that I have seen, that's an increase of about 70% from what, uh, what heretofore was considered the average number of unwanted horses per year in the United States. The market was glutted. Horses that had sold for $5,000 could be had for $300, $250, sometimes $100 free. Because of the elimination of the slaughterhouses and uh, also because of the economy, the number of unwanted horses has grown exponentially in the last couple of years. We, as in the United States, had voted to close all processing plants. I'm not saying that I'm a fan of, 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 of running horses through a processing plant, but for some horses and for some business people, that was a viable option. The cost of horse ownership also has been on the rise in the last couple of years, uh, which makes it less affordable than it once was. Hay that had been traditionally five, six, seven, sometimes eight dollars a bale, jumped to twelve, and by the end of the year it was sixteen dollars a bale. And there is going to be a, come a point in time where if you have 170,000 horses a year um, being pumped back into the system, so to speak, the, the system will burst. There's no way that it has the capacity to deal with 170,000 horses, unwanted horses per year. And unfortunately that was the beginning of the perfect storm. It, it, was, it, was, it was the beginning of, of one of the most horrific times in my life. It was truly, truly an awful period. The statistic that I read recently is 40% or so of the horse facilities are full. Horse facilities in general only have, um, um, only have room for or facilities for a limited number of horses, you know, 10, 20, 30 horses. So um, that 
situation, depending on parts of the country, general location, and so on, are drying up. That uh, that venue to be able to, to dispose of a horse are just drying up. If they're full, obviously they can't take them. So there isn't enough horse rescue facilities in the country to be able to handle anywhere near the numbers of unwanted horses there are. Our property is set up to have 11 horses and we typically have 18 because it's tough it's tough to say no it's tough to turn them away so we always laugh and say we're gonna start stacking them one on top of the other after a while when I started Wild Horse Ranch Rescue back in 95 most of the horses we got in were because of uh, lots of reasons like the horse is too old or my daughter no longer wants him. In the last three years, most of them that we've taken in are due to economics. With, with the economy the way it's been, we've definitely noticed a drop in donations. Uh, we have a program called Bail a Horse Out that used to, be, used to bring in right around $1,200 a month and that has basically been cut in half. And that's what we pretty much rely on to feed the herd. The PLA is the Pacific Livestock Auction. Um, it's held all across the country. Um, we have one um, out in Tempe that's held, I believe, weekly. Um, and it's all, it's all different types of livestock, but um, there are a lot of horses that go through there. It's also a place where guys that purchase horses for slaughter go and get the cheapest ones. They bid on you know, price per pound. So that's, that's where you'll hear about the killer buyers or the slaughter buyers and the double-decker trucks. And then they put them in these double-decker trucks and they bring them to either Canada or Mexico for slaughter. Um, horse meat is a delicacy in Asia and Western Europe and it's a very large market. This is Einstein. He came to us because a woman came to us and asked us if we would go to the Pacific Livestock Auction with her. She was looking to buy some horse property in Queen Creek and uh, she, she wanted to get a horse there. Um, we went with her and picked him up and she asked if she could keep him here for about two or three weeks while she secured her, her horse property. Um, we found out that the, the because of the economy and she had lost her job um, that the, the, the deal fell through on her getting the property um, and so she ended up coming back to the ranch with us and we never were able to get in touch with that woman again uh, she didn't respond to any of our emails or phone calls after that um, so Einstein ended up becoming a wild horse ranch horse people get involved in rescuing animals for a lot of reasons so I can't speak for everyone but for me personally it's it's not it has nothing to do with feeling good about it or the reward or or wanting to get a pat on the back, it's, I see a problem that needs help. These horses can't help themselves, and I can help them, and they, they need that. I'm not a very good business person when it comes to being in the horse business. I'm emotionally invested in my horses. They are my children. Um, I have no living children. Um, my, I've always been an animal person, but my horses were my kids. They, they encompass a lifetime worth of dreaming, hours and hours of planning, every dime I had uh, that, that didn't go for necessities. I was there for every step of their life. They were my, they were my babies. I couldn't place a single horse in that time period, not one. Um, so, in June of 2007, how well I remember it, I picked up the phone and called uh, the president of a uh, local horse rescue that I had been working with for many years. So I, I knew this was a good, a good place, and I remember calling Belinda, uh, who is, is the president of Equine Eden, and saying, I have a month's worth of hay on the place. I have 30-some-odd horses. When that hay runs out, I have two choices. Shoot them, turn the gun on myself, or get rid of them, give them away. And I can't say, I will give this horse, I won't give that horse. I can't be picking the horses anymore. Uh, the only horse I can't give away is my stallion, Olica. He, he deserves a home for life. So um, she swooped in and came to my rescue. I found 
truly wonderful homes, vetted the homes. It, and within a couple of weeks, my babies were driving out of that driveway. It was hideous. But it was better than the alternative. I mean, at least they had good homes. At least they would be cared for. I wouldn't see them anymore. But I knew that they would be safe. It was breaking her heart because this was her future. You, you know you're trying to do the best for the horses that you can. And giving them up is a hard decision, but sometimes it's the best decision. It is really hard. You, 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 you dream from the time you're a child. <laughs> Other kids, they build with blocks and stuff. I have, I still have pictures where I, I was designing my kennels, my barns, my house, where I was going to live. If we're going to solve the unwanted horse issue, then what we have to do is we have to solve the root problems and the causes of it, and not be so wrapped up in our emotions that we divide ourselves and we have a pro and a con to this issue or that issue, whether it be slaughter or education or economy causing it or whatever. It's, we know we have a problem, we know we have uh, a lot of unwanted horses. Whether we know the exact numbers or not, that's not the issue. The issue is, how do we fix that? I don't think there's one solution. I think there are a lot of things as a society that we can strive to be better at. And also, horse owners, if you own a horse, you know, I've heard so many people say, well, if they can't afford to keep them, then, you know, what can they do? They, they need a solution. They, they, need, they need some kind of solution. Well, part of owning a horse is knowing what's going to happen when you can no longer own him or when it's time for him to go. And just because you can't afford to have him euthanized doesn't mean you should just sell him at the auction and let him die a horrible death. I mean, there's nothing in this world that says if you take on an animal, some free funding is going to come out of the sky and save you. I think education um, to the public is, is key. Um, I think people understanding what's involved in taking care of a horse. Um, we get a lot of people that that will come to us that will want to adopt um, and, and our first the first thing that we want to do is educate them on, on what's involved and and we've also had people come to us and say that they want to start a rescue and we actually try to discourage it first to, to make sure that they understand all of the downsides of it because it's not a walk in the park it's not it's not something that's easy to do it's a lot of manual labor and it's hard work and, and raising the funds is always a constant challenge unless horse breeders get a lot more responsible um, and something magical happens I just don't see I just don't see a, a short-term solution will it balance out eventually 15 10 10 to 15 years down uh, in the future? Probably. Will I still be able to breed then? I don't know. I have other plans for 10 to 15 years from now. I, I want to be a recreational horse user, not a horse breeder. So my program that I worked so hard to develop for 20 years wiped out. And a lot of people will be wiped out. There'll be new people on the scene. It'll be a different a different world.